Hi, my name is Ray Pianca, and I am judge of the Cleveland Municipal Housing Court located in the city of Cleveland. There are 100,000 tenants in the city of Cleveland. Most of those tenants have a good working relationship with their landlord. However, at times, that relationship becomes strained, and landlords file actions in the Cleveland Municipal Housing Court. Last year, we had 10,000 landlord and tenant actions filed in the court most of which were eviction actions filed in the court, but also actions filed by tenants as well. When that relationship becomes strained, they must turn to the legal process and turn then into the Cleveland Municipal Housing Court. Over the next half hour, we are going to discuss some ways to strengthen the landlord-tenant relationship and provide instruction should that relationship deteriorate and the landlord want to take further steps on eviction. And steps that tenants can take if the landlord fails to meet his statutory duty. The Ohio Landlord Tenant Act, along with the codified ordinances of the City of Cleveland, set forth the rights and responsibility of landlords and tenants. Many of these rights and responsibility deal with the maintenance and upkeep of rental property. Under Ohio law, a residential landlord is required to do several things to ensure that his or her tenants are provided with a safe, habitable premises free of hazards or dangerous conditions. First, a landlord must comply with all applicable building, housing, zoning, fire, and safety codes that affect health or safety. Next, a landlord must make all necessary repairs to maintain the premises in a fit and habitable condition. In addition, he or she must keep common areas in a safe and sanitary condition. The landlord also must maintain all electrical, plumbing, heating, and sanitary systems in good working order. In addition, the landlord must apply running water to the premises. Finally, a landlord must provide the tenant with 24 hours notice before entering the property, absent an emergency. At the beginning of their relationship, many landlords and tenants face the question of whether or not to sign a written lease. Written leases or rental agreements, as they're sometimes called, can clarify both parties' expectations of the tenancy. Leases often include a variety of information about tenancies. A lease may include provisions about the amount of rent, the due date, and the names and ages of the people that live in the house or the apartment. It may also include rules about pets, disposal of trash, use of washers and dryers, parking, and noise. Many landlords and tenants are reluctant to sign a lease because they do not want to enter a long-term relationship. However, a lease may be for a term of less than one year. For example, the parties may agree upon a lease for a six-month term or for a one-month term. Many landlords buy a form lease and simply fill in the blanks. If you use a form lease, review it carefully and make sure it contains the terms in which you have agreed. You may cross out or change any parts of the form that you do not want to use. The landlord and tenant should initial any cross outs or changes at that time. You may decide to write your own lease. You do not have to have an attorney to write a lease, although you may want to talk to one. The finished lease should contain the signature of both the landlord and the tenant. Both the landlord and the tenant should have a signed copy of the lease. If the landlord and tenant enter into the agreements after the tenant moves in, they should consider putting those additional agreements in writing as well. In addition to ledger of payments, many landlords find it helpful to maintain a notebook of repair requests. 
repairs performed at the premises, and other contacts that they have with the tenants. Landlords also should keep copies of all notices that the landlord gave or, to re or received from the tenants. Landlords are not the only parties who benefit from keeping good records. Tenants should consider keeping a file or notebook of their own containing rent receipts, notices sent and received. The landlord and tenant may be able to resolve some disputes such as disputes about rent payments if both parties maintain accurate records and share the information that they both have. Good landlord-tenant relationships include open communications between the parties. Landlord and tenants frequently appear in court each complaining that the other did not communicate with them. It is essential that the landlord and tenant have a way to reach each other. A telephone or pager is useful in, in case of an emergency. Also, prompt communication makes prompt resolution of problems more likely. The tenant who tells the landlord early on of a slow bathtub drain is less likely to end up with a tub backflow and overflow. The landlord who visits the tenant's rental property develops a relationship with the tenant. In addition, she has a chance to see that the tenant is showing respect for the property in which he or she lives by keeping the property clean and undamaged. Sometimes, despite the best of intentions, landlords and tenants find that their relationship needs a little extra help to resolve the rough spots. The Housing Court offers free mediation services to landlords and tenants. In mediation, the landlord and tenant sit down with a mediator who is a neutral third party. With the help of the mediator, the landlord and tenant explore options to resolve their dispute. If the parties are able to make an agreement, the mediator will help the parties put the agreement into writing. Through this process, the parties may be able to preserve their landlord-tenant relationship or may be able to part ways more amicably. Mediation services are available to landlord and tenants whether or not they have a case pending in court. Oh, hello, Mrs. Uh, Jackson and Mr. Keller, is that correct? Okay, you were sent here from eviction court this morning? Okay, what I'd like to do is, um, I, my name is Yolanda Bayless, and I'm the mediation coordinator for Cleveland Municipal Housing Court. And what I'd like to do is explain to you what mediation is. Mediation is a process whereby the landlord and the tenant come together with a third neutral party to try to resolve their differences. If you're not able to resolve your differences, then you would go back to court. Mediation is confidential. That means that if you're not able to work things out here, then uh, you would go back to court today. And um, I would not discuss with the magistrate whatever you discussed here. The only thing that is not... Um, confidential about mediation is if either party would admit to some type of crime such as child abuse, elder abuse, or something on that order. Do you have any questions so far? Mm -hmm. What happens in mediation? Each party has a chance to tell their side of the story. Each party has a chance to say how they would like to see things resolved. Um, if you're able to resolve them, then we come up with a written agreement. And because there is a case, an eviction case, um, whatever agreement you would come up with, it would be enforceable by the court. Any questions? Okay, what I'd like to do is first have you sign this agreement to mediate. I'll read it to you, and then I'm going to hand it to you to read for yourselves, and I'm going to ask you if you'll sign it. Uh, in signing this document, I agree to take part in a mediation where a third party will act as a neutral in this dispute. I'm giving the neutral no authority to make a decision or intervene in any way except to help the above named parties reach their own decision. I agree to carry out the agreement if the mediation results in a written agreement. I understand that everything said during the mediation will be confidential and may not be discussed outside of the mediation by the mediator or the parties or be used in a court hearing. However, I understand that the mediator is not bound by confidentiality on the issue of child abuse, elder abuse, or admission of a crime. This is basically what I've explained to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you if you will look at this. And at the bottom there, uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Keller, we have your name and your address there at the top, and if you'll sign underneath that, I'd appreciate it. We'll be starting with Mr. Um, Mr. Keller. However, there is one thing I uh, meant to tell you, and that is 
um, there is one ground rule. The ground rule is that you're courteous to each other. That means that you will not interrupt each other when you're talking. The only party that will be able to interrupt you would be me, and the only reason I will interrupt you is because I'm trying to get a better understanding of what is being said by you. Any questions on that? Yeah. Do you both feel that you can um, obey that ground rule? I think so. Okay, thank you. Rent deposit is a remedy that a tenant can use when a landlord has not fulfilled their obligations to them in, in regard to the conditions of the unit. Um, and basically the, the program works like this. There are requirements that a tenant needs to meet uh, prior to rent depositing. If they truly feel that a landlord has not taken care of some repairs or necessary items in their unit, they need to provide the landlord with a 30-day written letter explaining what those repairs are um, and give the landlord basically that amount of time to take care of the problems. Unless, of course, the severity of the problem um, would mandate that they'd have to be taken care of much sooner. Um, those kinds of conditions might be um, a broken boiler or a pipe that might have broken, causing um, uh, water service to be shut down. In that case, uh, the amount of time that a landlord will be given to uh, remedy the situation would be much shorter. Uh, however, uh, other necessary repairs should be given in writing to the landlord. After this 30-day period, if the landlord has failed to take care of the, the repairs that the, the tenant has stated, then the tenant may come down to the court. Uh, they would go to the second floor of the clerk of court's office. Uh, where a deputy clerk would assist them in filling out a form uh, and the form requires the name, address, and phone number, if possible, of the landlord and the same information on themselves. Their rent must be current in order for them to participate in the rent deposit program and they need to deposit the entire amount of rent that's due on the rental due date. Once they do that, uh, what happens is a mediation is scheduled through our mediation coordinator. A mediation is a voluntary uh, meeting of the two people that are involved in the dispute, uh, which would be the landlord and the tenant. It gives them an opportunity to resolve these issues or disputes uh, between themselves without uh, any other intervention by the court. The mediator will assist them. The mediator can write up an agreement that the two of them um, have made between themselves uh, to help remedy these disputes. Once this agreement is, is written, the mediator will have the judge sign this agreement and the, and the court will uphold the agreement. Uh, the two people involved, the landlord and tenant, will receive copies of that agreement. This agreement is not an agreement that the mediator writes for the the two parties involved. This is an agreement that the two parties have written um, for themselves. Should somebody default on the agreement um, once it's signed, uh, the mediator will help incorporate uh, circumstances in the agreement that will allow them to come back to the court and take some action um, if the agreement is not upheld by both parties. Usually this is in the form of a show cause hearing. Uh, one party will come in and file a motion with the court asking for a show cause hearing um, due to the fact that there are some issues in the, in the agreement that have not been met. The court will then hold a, a brief and fairly quick hearing in regard to that. Um, and if it's found that the default is in fact true, then uh, the court will uphold whatever remedies or conditions that were written in the agreement. Um, so that the parties will finally have uh, the dispute resolved one way or the other. A rent deposit protects the tenant from eviction. When there are repairs that aren't being made, uh, the tenant just simply cannot withhold their rent from the landlord, nor can they hold on to their rent to make the repairs themselves. Uh, this is a program whereby the tenant can deposit their rent with the court that we hold in an escrow account. By rent depositing, the tenant is protected from any eviction action that the landlord may impose on them. Once the tenant rent deposits with the clerk of courts, the clerk of courts will mail a receipt of the rent deposit to the landlord, notifying them that their money is now with the court. And they will also mail them a 
appointment with the mediation coordinator so that they have the option of coming in to resolve the dispute. Now, one of the things that the mediator might encourage the parties to do during the mediation is to write up a repair schedule. That way the landlord has some time to complete all of the repairs needed and the tenant has the guarantee that the landlord will be working on the repairs that are necessary to their unit. In 1997, nearly 250 tenants deposited their rent with the Cleveland Municipal Court in an attempt to resolve the disputes with their landlord and get their necessary repairs met. The eviction process generally starts with service of a notice. Tenant conduct such as disturbing the neighbors, failing to dispose of garbage, and poor housekeeping require a 30-day notice to the tenant. This notice must be in writing and must state specifically the grounds upon which the landlord is seeking to evict. For example, a notice regarding disturbance of neighbors should contain the date, time, and location of each disturbance and, if possible, name the individuals involved. A notice for poor housekeeping should specify the dates on which the landlord observed the housekeeping and describe the conditions that are problematic. After receipt of a notice for poor tenant conduct, the tenant has 30 days to correct the behavior or cure the breach. For example, if a landlord serves a notice for poor housekeeping, the tenant has 30 days to clean up the premises and begin to maintain it in a clean and sanitary condition. Proper service of a three-day notice is what gives the court jurisdiction to hear an eviction case. A landlord must serve a three-day notice before filing the complaint. State law requires the three-day notice to contain certain language informing the tenants of their rights. In the city of Cleveland, that language must be conspicuous, which the court defines as twice as large and in contrasting print as all other language in the notice. The landlord must serve the three-day notice by certified mail or by leaving it at the property. The landlord must prove that she served the three-day notice. To do so, a landlord may want to post the three-day notice on the property and then take a photograph of it and bring the photograph to court. A landlord may also want to bring a witness with him when he serves the notice. After serving the three-day notice, the next step in the eviction process is filing the complaint with the court. A landlord may want to consult an attorney or have an attorney represent them in court. Landlords, however, often file their cases on their own, which is called pro se. Whether you have an attorney or not, certain rules apply. The complaint that you file with the court must state specifically the reason for the eviction. It must identify the tenant and the address of the premises accurately. The complaint must be signed by the person who is identified as the plaintiff, who is the person bringing the complaint. If a complaint is filed in the name of a corporation, the complaint must be signed by an attorney, and that attorney must be present with the corporate officer in court. Complaints are filed with the clerk of courts on the second floor of the Justice Center. The clerk of court collects the filing fees, creates the file, and acts as the custodian of the file after it is created. In addition to the files, the clerk maintains a separate record on the of the case on computer, tracking each entry in order of the court. When filing the complaint with the clerk, the landlord must bring the original complaint, two copies, and the filing fee. The clerk creates a file when the complaint is filed and makes arrangements for the tenant to receive a copy of the summons and complaint. This is referred to as service. The tenant usually is sent a copy by certified and regular mail. A landlord, however, may ask the court's bailiff to serve the summons and complaint. Eviction hearings are usually held 21 days from the date of filing of the complaint. This hearing may be rescheduled if the tenant requests a jury or a bench trial or if the court is not able to serve the defendant. Eviction hearings are usually held in courtroom 3A on the third floor of the Justice Center. The hearings are held by a magistrate. The magistrates are attorneys who are employed by the court to assist the judge by holding hearings and recommending decisions on cases. The magistrate's recommendation is not final until it's approved by the judge. Eviction hearings are held Monday through Friday at 9 o'clock and 10.30 a.m. The dockets begin at 9 o'clock a.m. and may continue as late as noon. All cases are scheduled for 9 o'clock or 10.30. The courtroom bailiff determines the order in which the cases will be called. Cases with attorneys may be called first to limit the attorney fees to be paid by the parties. The bailiff may also call cases early if small children or disabled individuals are called, are involved. Uh, it's important that you be on time for your eviction hearing because it may be called right at 9 o'clock. When the case is called, both the landlord and the tenant step up to the bench. The bailiff, who normally stands next to the magistrate, will, will direct them to swear to tell the truth, and the magistrate will begin to take testimony. 
The magistrate begins by taking testimony from the landlord. Uh, the plaintiff will be asked if he or she is the owner of the property or the property manager, if the defendant is the tenant, and if the property is located in the city of Cleveland. The magistrate will ask the landlord about the conduct which led to the filing of the complaint. After asking the landlord questions, the magistrate will ask the tenant whether notices were received and about the allegations in the complaint. The landlord is the person bringing the case has the burden of proof. That means the landlord must prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the tenant violated the lease or the Ohio Revised Code and that the landlord served the proper notices. The tenant must testify about the notices served and produce copies of the notice along with copies of the lease. If the owner is evicting for non-payment, the court will want to know when the last payment of rent was received, the period that rent covered, and the date of service of the three-day notice. A landlord may be required to produce rent records in order to support their case. Cases involving tenant conduct are more difficult to prove. A landlord who is alleging that the tenant has breached their lease will be required to bring to court witnesses who saw the conduct described in the 30-day notice. In addition, the landlord may be required to produce photographs, citations from building and housing, or police reports. In drug cases, a landlord must show that a warrant was issued, um, a search warrant was issued for the property, must indicate that the warrant was properly executed, and must be able to prove that drugs were found at the property. The landlord generally will need the testimony of a police officer and a report from the police forensic laboratory to prove his or her case. After the hearing, the magistrate usually will tell the parties in court what the decision is. This is a recommendation to the judge, and when it's approved by the judge, it becomes final. If the judgment is in favor of the landlord, the landlord will be told to purchase a writ of restitution and arrange a move-out date. The tenant generally will be granted seven days within which to move. The court may, on rare occasions, extend that move-out date upon showing of special circumstances by the tenant. Okay, when it gets to this um, part of the uh, eviction, the um, property owner or property manager has come down got the uh, judgment and uh, what we do is uh, have one of our bailiffs deliver a red tag. This is uh, really not necessary but what we try to do is have the people move out on their own and so what we try to do is uh, get them to move out their own by delivering one of these. Uh, we come out on the date that's set with the uh, property owner and if the individuals have not moved out then what we do is along with a moving company uh, go forward with the eviction. Pretty much leave the stuff on the, uh, on the street? Well, the, um, they're usually left out around 24 hours for 24 hours. Uh, after that, the property owner can um, have it removed. How, how, um, how much notice have these people had that this was going to happen, usually? Okay, generally they usually are notice, not, notified by uh, certified mail, uh, regular mail. And also, we have our bailiffs um, go out, um, individual, like I said before, red tags, and notify them that the uh, eviction will be taking place. Okay. And these people have plenty of notice. Oh, yeah. Magistrate Witt, my tenant is a Section 8 tenant. Is the eviction procedure different for subsidized tenants? Well, the procedure is different in the sense that uh, a, a Section 8 tenancy involves both federal law and regulation and uh, state law. So a landlord initiating an eviction uh, in the Section 8 situation must comply with federal standards as well as state standards. Uh, specifically, uh, in a Section 8 situation, uh, a landlord is required to give a notice which provides a resident uh, an opportunity to meet with the landlord and discuss the situation uh, prior to the eviction being initiated. Good morning, Magistrate Lewis. Good morning. Is it true that the court does not do move-outs in the winter? No, the court may limit the number of move-outs which can take place around the Christmas and New Year's holidays because of staff limitations but the court does perform supervised move-outs five days a week, all 12 months of the year. Are there any special service available, services available for elderly tenants who are being evicted? We commonly refer people that are over the age of 60 to the Department of Aging. Uh, and the Department of Aging will assist them, uh, this mainly refers to tenants, uh, in finding a new place to live and um, 
assist them in any way that they can be helpful to them as far as uh, meeting their housing needs or if they have other social service needs. So um, we don't necessarily delay the move out unless we have to, unless it's a special circumstances, but we do, if the people tell us they are in need of uh, special services, we do make a referral to uh, the Department of Aging.